Welcome to Block Time, a podcast by Riot Platforms, where we take a deep dive into Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, electricity, and the grid. Today, we've got a really special, wonderful guest from Texas A&M University, Professor Karok Ray. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Great to see you. And thank you for having me. Um, so what brings you to town first uh, is my, my question. Uh, College Station, a couple hours away from our location here. Yeah. Well, I wanted to be here with you on this uh, on this podcast. Also, I'll be going to BitDevs tonight, uh, so the monthly Bitcoin developers meetup downtown, and, uh, and then to see my parents also who are in the area. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. BitDevs, uh, Austin uh, BitDevs meets every month on Thursday. Um, so... That's awesome. Why why do you go to BitDevs? Uh, I think that it's important to to have the infomercial in there for right. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like BitDevs a lot because it uh, it really combines what's unique about it showcases what's unique about Bitcoin, which is that it's very technical and yet it is uh, it's a spoken language and it combines this in a really unique way. And I want my students to be able to develop that facility and develop that skill. So. Uh, I try. I go there and I try, I kind of share with the class what uh, what what I let learned, and then eventually I would want my students to go as well to develop that skill. So, so at this meetup, they go through kind of somewhat of um, what are technical topics currently being discussed uh, online on on mailing lists, that, and kind of bring those to the public and to the forefront um, because Bitcoin. Being open source, being decentralized, is very participatory. Right, right. That we do need like grassroots involvement in all questions. That's right, exactly right. Yeah, and it's it's uh, yeah it, the the format is a few a few people present uh, one of the recent bips and we'll go through some of the arguments and then it's kind of a free for all discussion in the Socratic style uh, in in the among the audience. So it really is kind of the liberal arts meets technology. So it's a nice mix. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and I think for the folks who are studying for political science or governance like they should like take a look at how bitcoin works oh from for sure the technical perspective yeah absolutely absolutely there's there's uh and i think the, i've i've gone to one other bit devs uh i just i just love that combination and it's to me it really is the secret skill of the future like kids who can do that who can speak technical language uh but oral but communicate that combination is the that's the secret sauce that's true um so Let's rewind. Yeah. Uh, for how did you first uh, kind of decide where you wanted to be in life? Uh, right. You know, in terms of studying and, and work. Yeah. So I I grew up in Boston. Um, I like to say I, it was a, a suburb of Bombay called uh, called Boston. Um, yeah. And I grew up in a, a sort of a a fairly uh, Indian community uh, in in the Boston area. And I grew up. My 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 hobby was reading economics. And so. I read Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman as, at a young age in high school. and um, I, I watched the video series. Did you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he, he's great. Yeah. He's, he's just what a masterful communicator. And he was, um, he was a big inspiration to me back then. I, I read about the University of Chicago where he was. And so I, I sent my application there. I was admitted. Went to the University of Chicago uh, in uh, a while, in the last century, unfortunately. And, uh, and I, I studied economics and math. Uh, I decided I still wanted to learn more economics. And so I went to Stanford for my PhD. Uh, then I returned back to Chicago on faculty. Um, my advisor at the, from Stanford was a former Chicago professor. And so my intellectual upbringing is very much in free market economics. That's kind of where I intellectually Literally come from. Chicago school. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Literally Chicago Fresh school. Fresh water. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. And... Um, and so it was. It was a, a great time. It's a, the Chicago was a. It still is a very unique university, uh, and it, probably even more so back then. And they were um, really com still com very committed to to free market economics, and uh, and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Yeah, yeah that's that's fascinating. I, I'm remembering a conversation I had with a accounting faculty member at UT Austin, uh -huh. where we were talking about um, really about finance. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, you know, you picked the wrong university. You should have gone to University of Chicago. <laughs> like UT Austin, like we've got like a different perspective right, on right. this. And uh, that's right. Uh, he was right. But uh, I just like the warmer weather here. Yeah, uh, so, I don't blame you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That was uh, uh, it's Chicago during, during most <laughs> like outside of two months is, is, is unlivable. <laughs> 
Yeah. So you, you, you had this economics um, and, and math and computer science as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, right? exactly right. I was a minor in computer science. My major was in math. I actually did not major in economics, but, mm-hmm. uh, but I took a bunch of the graduate classes, knowing that I wanted to get my PhD in economics. Yeah. E- econometrics? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. took. I I was actually more in. Uh, I so I took econometrics. It w- it wasn't my favorite class. Okay. I was more into game theory and uh, and and microeconomic theory, which is what I eventually pursued in graduate school, and so um, that was my kind of my my bread and butter. Got it. And and applying it in what context? Yeah. So um, so my dissertation at Stanford was on. Uh, you, you'd be interested to know. This is kind of a real detail that most people don't know. It's on performance targets, okay. and uh, as you know, Bitcoin has targets inside. And and my area at, at the time, this was 2004, pre-Bitcoin, was on essentially the uh, the game theory of target setting. And so, um, what just to put so you know what box I fit in, I I'm a within game theory. Game theory is the broad umbrella of of my my discipline. And then inside of that, there's a subfield called contract theory. And then inside of that, I was on, I was, you know, one of a few people working on performance targets. And that was my dissertation at Stanford, uh, which was the culmination of my thinking over five years, as well as some of my work as an undergraduate. What were some like counterintuitive things you found in that, or or things that are intuitive but not explicitly stated often enough? Uh, with regards to to target setting and incentives like that, yeah. So I'll I'll give you I'll give you one obvious and one so not not so obvious uh, uh, example. So um, the uh, the obvious is that the target really matters for incentives. Um, and so when I say when I'm thinking of targets, I'm thinking of you can think of a CEO who is facing an earnings target, or a uh, uh, even someone in a in a sports tournament, uh, or really any kind of any kind of competition uh, where they have to their performance has to clear some fixed level in order to receive some kind of a, a bonus or reward. And, um, and the first is that the targets really matter for incentives. That part is obvious. Uh, I think the part that's less obvious is how exactly it matters. Um, and so I did some, some work on, um, I'll give you a little, a little example on, uh, in a tournament in, in Wimbledon, right? So what, what happens is, uh, as the uncertainty in the environment increases, um, the the players or the agents will will reduce their incentives uh, will and reduce their effort, um, and uh, the the principal in this case, who is the designer of the system, will compensate by increasing the uh, the bonus or the reward. So let me give you a little like, story of how that what that means. So imagine imagine you have uh, people playing tennis on a grass court, right, versus a concrete court. So yeah. the grass court has more uncertainty because you, the, when the ball hits the grass, it could go either way. And because there's more uncertainty, the, uh, the players, uh, they basically they will rationally reduce their effort. And their effort will go down. And the, the designer, Wimbledon, could compensate for this by increasing the reward to the, the winners on a grass field versus a concrete field. So basically, people are looking at the reward. They're discounting it with some risk and uncertainty adjustment. Right. And the more you discount that, then that means that you have to increase the reward yes. to get to the same outcome. Yes, exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was my dissertation and it was um it kind of took this analysis of tournaments, uh like the Wimbledon tournament, to this world of targets. And I wrote probably a dozen, maybe a dozen papers on this topic over the next decade. And uh, okay. I I really I really dug in because uh, I was the expert on this area, and and uh, I al- already invested my time and energy learning about it. And there were lots of lots of new applications. Yeah, I still have new papers now that are using the same basic model. Got it. Yeah. Wow. And so then it goes into applying it to corporate America, right? Yeah. Um, and does it get into as well kind of the uh, issues around um, I- in the public sector? Yeah. Of uh, public choice theory and kind of uh, what are the incentives faced by bureaucracies or uh, even in the private sector within kind of middle management rather uh-huh. than like just the top CEO? Yeah, so so I will say I never really got into the mid middle management mostly because the data in this area is all based at the CEO level. Right, right. And so uh, companies have to disclose compensation of their C-suite. And so I... Uh, I wanted to develop theories that could eventually be tested with data. 
which my co-authors have, have been testing uh, over the last few years. And so that's primarily why I've stayed at the at the CEO level. Yeah. And then looking at it on the Bitcoin side, yeah. Um, would you say, you know, it's kind of interesting because people look at Bitcoin's price and they're like, Bitcoin's very volatile. Right. But then if we look at the software engineering and like its uh, structure, it has very little uncertainty. Right. You know, like right. we, we know when that there's going to be a halving in 210,000 yeah. blocks. Um, and, and so how do you think about risk and uncertainty in the context of Bitcoin's incentives that would drive adoption or drive use of it? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I've always heard the argument on the volatility, and that always has been puzzling to me. Uh, I think people generally, when they say that, to me, they're confusing two things. They're confusing the uh, the volatility of the, the BTC USD exchange rate, which is what people call the price of Bitcoin, versus the uh, how much the currency itself changes, which is is, is actually very little, as you notice. Uh, mostly be, 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 the inflation rate in Bitcoin is much smaller than the inflation rate of of most of the fiat currencies today. And so, um, you know, when we're in this transitional period where people are thinking about fiat versus Bitcoin, then in those cases, maybe they're worried about volatility. But in the long game, when we move to a Bitcoin standard, if we do, and I hope we do, then um, I think the volatility question will, will really vanish because, it, it, as you know, it's extremely predictable. The subsidy is, uh, sh you know, shrinking on a very predictable schedule. And so I see no problem with volatility at that point. Right. Um, and, and at full adoption, you, you can't really have volatility if it's already just a part of people's balance sheets. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did that answer your question? I, I, it, it, it did. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think that, you know, the um, w when when people talk about Bitcoin as a store of value, there is that question of its purchasing power. Right. But I also think that there's the question of the store, uh, which is really about like storing your private keys, like right. the, wh how much uncertainty do you have if you pull out your 12 or 24 words yeah. that you'll be able to unlock that UTXO right. and that by the laws of math and cryptography, yeah. we can actually have tremendous amount of certainty on the store part, even if on the value part, we assign some volatility of it. And then you combine those yeah. to, to reach to an outcome where you're like, all right, well, I'm not going to use this for like short-term savings. Yeah. But long-term savings, there's just, just a no-brainer. Yeah, I like that. I like what I like that plan words with the store of value. I think yeah. you're right. The the cryptography is is undeniable and it's 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 it's, it's, it's you know, it's more transparent and uh, we have a better understanding of that than than we do of any any uh, really any other cybersecurity uh, apparatus in today's economy, right? Yeah. If you compare it, you compare it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, okay. So now, uh, where is your focus in terms of research? Uh, and, but really, actually, before we go to that, you mentioned, you know, you, you dug into this topic for the yeah. better part of a decade. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, how did that fit into kind of your career tra trajectory and where you wanted to, to go? Right, right, right. Well, um, so I took one major detour, um, in my career and that actually is what led me to Bitcoin. Um, so my, my academic research was always on performance target. And that, like I said, that happened over, over a decade. And that's what I eventually received tenure uh, on. And, and sort of my, my scholarly uh, profile is all based on performance targets. Um, in my third year at the University of Chicago, I made a, a somewhat radical choice is to leave the university and take a leave of absence to join the Council of Economic Advisors under George W. Bush. Um, and the way that happened was my, uh, I'd like to say it was a na nationwide search. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah. And there the were thousands of applicants emerged, and yeah. I emerged as a sole winner. But the truth is that my dissertation advisor, um, I was his last student and his next student was President Bush. So he became the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. And it's very customary for the chair to hire his former students as his staff. And so I, in 2007, I brought a one-way ticket to Washington, D.C., and I thought I was going to get a lot of research done on performance targets during that time. But in August of 2007, that's when the credit market started to, to start collapsing. And I was the financial services economist for that year. And so I was able to see and, and be a part of the financial crisis up close. And um, I think what I'll uh, – I, I could talk for hours about it. But I, th I think what I'll share with you is that there was essentially a war of ideas internally – I was on the, the free market economic side, as you could guess, 
And then I think the other side, there was, uh, you could say, the Republicans who were protecting Wall Street side, yeah. you know, ex- protecting the existing business. Um, so you could say we were trying to protect competition. They were trying to comp- protect existing competitors. Now, if I were to steel man their position, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they would probably say, hey, there's also a political calculus here that in terms of voters being negatively impacted, if we allow firms to go under further tightening the credit environment, you know, then people's credit cards limits are getting cut and then they don't vote for you. Right. And then, you know, it's kind of this idea of like, um, you got to get through and survive and lay your principles to the side. Right. And and they would always make that argument. Yeah. Exactly. They would make the political argument and they would always start conversations that say, look, I'm a markets guy, but... And, yeah, and the, yeah, right, and right, the right, but yeah. would be, well, in this special circumstance, we can't let the market work. Right. And, uh, you know, our, on our side, uh, we, we we thought that was nonsense. You know, we thought actually markets are not just convenient things that only work when you want them to. Um, and we fought that we fought that battle for the entire year I was there. Um, and frankly, I think we won that battle for the first six months of that I was there. That, that was the last six months of 07. And then we started losing that battle in the first starting in 08 when – uh, I think the president uh, started siding with the um, the other the other voices in the room, mostly from the Treasury Department, uh, to advocate for more explicit bailouts of the financial system. And um, so, I want to ask. I don't know if this is an appropriate question to ask. Yeah. Do you think the president changed his mind as we got closer to election day, or were there other you know? data points being pointed to him that, hey, this is getting a lot worse and it's going to get out of hand and it's going to snowball and have a circular feedback loop. Yeah, I think it was the the latter. And I'll tell you why. I think it's um, I don't I actually I honestly don't believe that President Bush was uh, at that point cared so much exclusively about the, the political consequences. It was more he, he did want to do the right thing. And for him, um, the, the, the the various voices in the in the government at the time, we were the Council of Economic Advisors on one side, let the market self-correct. Um, the Wall Street voice was from uh, the Treasury Secretary, who, who was the former CEO of Goldman Sachs. He was representing uh, essentially the, the views that he was hearing routinely from Wall Street. And then the third person in the room, I guess who you could say maybe shouldn't have been in the room, was the Fed chair. And the Fed chair is... Uh, I thought you were going to say John McCain since he was <laughs> running. Right. Yeah. Right, right, okay. right. Yeah, the yeah. Fed chair. The Fed at chair the time was... Was Bernanke. Ben Bernanke, yeah. yeah. And the Fed chair was uh, essentially... You know, he was the former head of the Council of Economic Advisors. He was very close with our office. He saw all of our analysis. And uh, he was he was essentially on our side in the beginning. And then when the when the markets got worse, he, he felt the need for greater intervention and that changed at the end of 07. And when that changed, he, the president decided to uh, switch switch the tune. Um, I'm reminded, and I, I think you hopefully you'll be able to provide a lot of color on this quote, yeah. of when Bernanke told Milton Friedman <laughs> that, they, that they had failed in the Great Depression uh-huh. and that it wouldn't happen again. And I think the context was that they, you know, th- there was so much, well, I, I don't know. Do you, is, is, is that quote something that, that resonates with you or that you think is missing like some elements to it? I, I haven't heard that quote. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because, yeah, it was um, it was before Bernanke was uh, it was uh, before he was Fed chairman. I mean, given that Milton Friedman was still alive at the time. Right. But, right. Um, I, I believe that what Bernanke was saying was uh, essentially that they allowed the Fed allowed too much financial disintermediation to happen in the Great Depression of kind of just letting things drop uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and uh, not fighting ag- aggressively enough to prop things up. I see. And that, um, but I guess the part that I didn't connect on was why he was telling Milton Friedman this <laughs> as like, um, but, but I think it also had to do with kind of just looking through the whole business cycle that they had created a bubble right, as well. Right, um, right. But then it kind of just raises the question of, policies that have been followed since then of it seems yeah. like they create bubbles and right. then they need to bail everyone out yeah exactly right that's exactly right yeah and that's exactly what happened uh both leading up to the great financial crisis and during that was that was uh and you know we we tried to make that argument internally and it uh you know at some point they um people got tired of hearing that from us and so yeah i bet yeah well so 
like my view is that it's just inevitable that yeah. if you can print the money, yeah. you're going to have so much pressure applied that you're going to print the money. Right. Yeah. That is right. That is right. And I, and I will say, to be fair, I mean, I was on the fiscal side, not the monetary side. Yeah. So the decisions. Well, we let's were, let's call it broadly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So so on the on the fiscal side, it's still a bailout, right? Yeah. It, it's just it was with TARP rather than with quantitative easing. But but they were. It's it's the same same essential idea. That's right. So bringing it to today. Yeah. Do you think that some of the same conversations are happening in the Biden White House when they're <laughs> looking at SVB and kind of broader distress in the banking system like it seems like the whole banking system you know is in this hard place of interest rates rising yeah uh the mortgage market not moving because rates are eight percent nobody wants to move right and then commercial real estate having to go into this refinancing cycle right with really much weaker fundamentals right due to work from home and all that right do, so do you think that like we're at the early stages of another financial crisis like we were in 07? So uh, those are big questions. Um, yeah. the, the Biden question, I, I can't speak for them. I don't yeah. know. You know, the, the, I mean, now not only are, are the, the economic teams across different parties pretty separate, but then across different administrations, they're, they're pretty separate. So um, I don't know what they're, what they're debating. I, I would hope that they have the voice of markets uh, at the table, but I you know, certainly can't, can't promise that. Um, it's probably like, do we print billions or trillions? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So Matt, that's the scale. That's yeah. the scale question. Yeah, they have it. I would say they have it a little bit harder than we did because my view is that Bernanke, you know, I guess in shades of gray, even though Bernanke did intervene heavily in the markets, his actions uh, were in some level less aggressive than Powell, than the current Fed chair. And so the current economic team is dealing with even more, you know, the swings in the Fed fund funds rate are more extreme now than they were when I when we were there. Right. You, you know. Now there was a hiking cycle. Yeah. And was it 05, 06? Right. There was. There was. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I, I think it, it, it was much. It more, was slower. Yeah. 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 It, it wasn't like, uh, you know, this this rapid expansion of M2 during the pandemic, which is like the hist historically the, the fastest increase in the money supply since, you know, the 70s, essentially, yeah. you know. So so that is, um, that was, and I, and I think Bernanke also was, um, some level, he was, he, I mean, as an academic and intellectual, he did really, really debate these issues. And, uh, and it took him, a, you know, we, because I guess I know because I was there. I mean, we were in these meetings and, and he was, it wasn't until 08 when he actually started to do, to take more aggression on the, in the markets. Um, and so there was a lot more, it seemed to me on the, at least if I had to compare the two, there was more deliberation and more, um, more, a little bit more attention to market consequences than now. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think the other big difference is the inflation rate. Yeah. Uh, that, um, you know, this cycle of inflation really started with people saying, it's transitory right. now, whether they earnestly believe that or they were playing politics. Yeah. Uh, but now it seems almost uh, there's a debate as to whether it's entrenched or if it's actually there is disinflation and, you know, we're, we're heading towards back to 2%. Right, um, right. And it just seems like it depends on what you're looking at. Yeah. So let me answer that in, in, in yeah. uh, a serious but also somewhat facetious way, yeah. which is that I have no idea and I don't think anyone has any idea. <laughs> yeah. And and the truth of macroeconomics is that the macroeconomy is so complex uh, to me, far beyond the complexity of any human being or group of individuals to try to manage that we should not even be trying to manage. I mean, it's it's um, uh, I gave my I gave uh, the Fed chair's Jackson Hole speech to my students to read and say, let's do a, an ad analysis of the speech. What do we what do we learn? What do we know about what the Fed is going to do and what the problems are in the economy? And no one in the room, including myself, could figure this out. <laughs> and it's it's because macroeconomics as a discipline, at least as practiced by central bankers, has become essentially uh, a amount of just fog that you just yeah. throw into the air and confuse people. And 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 uh, and you know maybe there's some theories that some people have for why the economy will move in one direction versus another. But just look at the record of history. It's it's just uh, in, in it's, you know this last century has been uh, been embarrassing. I think of of what the, what what well. The, the, yeah, people call it Fed speak. Right, right. right it's right. just like this, like weird theatrical performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is it is it because kind of same thing with COVID, where they were like, "Hey, look, the public can't possibly understand what we're actually deliberating, what the real issues are." Right. 
and they only absorb, you know, one sentence sound bites. Yeah. So therefore, that's all we can manufacture. Right. Publicly. Right. And then anything substantive is going to happen privately. Right. Which, you know, in in a democracy, yeah. it's completely antithetical to the <laughs> idea that the people would understand what's going on. Yeah. And, but that that view itself, I think, gives to me too much credit to the private conversations. The ones that I was privy to during the crisis, even when I was at the table, I felt like the macro the macro economists and the macro views still made very little sense to me. And, and I'm a PhD yeah. economist. so And people are Fed speaking at you. Right. And you're like, yeah. hey, you guys can be real with me. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to yeah, yeah. gobbledygook. That's right. Exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. And so. But maybe that's all they have. Like I think really isn't. Yeah, that's right. That's all they have. And and I think their argument is that well, we have 250 PhD economists at the Federal Reserve Board who are backing up these these views, but it does you know that number of economists. There's no such number that I think will let you get it right. Yeah. Whether it's 250 or 250 thousand, right. it's still just way too complex. And you know the early intellectuals in this space like Hayek and Friedman were they were aware of this. I mean they were. I mean Friedman is on record as we speak. As we, as we were as we were bringing him bringing him him up, he's on record for saying that you know central banking is is just too complex an activity for human beings to do. Hayek also felt felt the same way, and a committee of people should not be deciding this. Yeah. Um, well, here we are with a committee of people deciding it, <laughs> right? Um, and right. Uh, it you know I think there's lots of macro commentators, the kind of the critics of the Fed who have become like doomsayers, right? And um, I feel like. In the Bitcoin community, that's very present, uh, that perspective. Right. Um, but, the, yeah, you're right. Ultimately, hey, look, if AI increases productivity by some percentage, then uh, a lot of doomer predictions that are looking 10 years in the future yeah. aren't more precise than what these 250 PhDs are saying <laughs> right. within the Fed. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So how... Uh, you know, if, if a central bank is not in charge, yeah, I think that yeah, the, yeah. the argument um, that we hear most often is really around the elasticity of money supply, right? Uh -huh. The money supply has to be elastic because there's changes in the seasons and of, you know, cash balance requirements for yeah. business and consumers. And kind of what what's your, your, your perspective on that? And, you know, basically, how would a Bitcoin economy work if you don't have uh, that kind of elasticity? Yeah, so I think that's that's an area of economics, um, and I would say it is primarily in the macro versus the micro area, where it's not there isn't a lot of really good theoretical foundation for what those ideas are. So it gets and, debunked by micro people. Yeah, right? exactly right, exactly right. And and in in macro, there are a lot of rules of thumb that people use. That's one of them. Another rule of thumb is that deflation is bad. People have that as a rule of thumb. Yeah. And if you push them on this, you say, why exactly is that the case? There's no good answer. I think they'll, they'll maybe some poorly formed Keynesian economics will come out, but there's really no good microeconomic answer for what this is. So I, um, you know, I think the uh, as for the money supply, I, to me though, the way to think about this is: should people be in charge of this? Should we have discretion, or should we should we use a rule? And this debate between rules versus discretion, it's been around for 30, 40 years, um, uh, and there have been many many prominent people. My favorite are is a. Uh, uh, the no, the 2004 Nobel Prize in economics that went to kid uh, uh, Ed Prescott and kid Fid Fidland, uh, and Fidland and Prescott both said that actually, um, you know, the, it it actually is better to stick stick to a rule, even if that rule is not the best rule, it will still beat discretionary mo monetary management, meaning the central banks playing uh, changing it at their whim. And by rule, do you mean something like the Taylor rule, um, or yep. like? Uh Fixed money supply, percentage increase, like yeah. Friedman's. All yeah. of those are examples. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And even Friedman agrees. It, it doesn't so matter matter what the rule is as long as that there is a rule. Because if, if there is no rule, what happens is that you shatter market expectations and, and rational expectations, and it creates all this uncertainty in the marketplace that is unnecessary. And I saw this myself during the financial crisis. I would make these trips up to Wall Street and, and there were big investors that I met. They would ask me, what are you guys, do you guys have a plan? What are you guys going to do with the, when the next bank fails? Because it doesn't matter. Just tell us what the plan is, then we will adjust because we have capital to de deploy. And the truth is we had no plan. Right. You know, it, it really, yeah. we were just making it up as we went along. And all that capital sits on the sidelines. 
And it leads to this kind of multi-layers of moral hazard where, where all this uh, you know, capital doesn't get deployed because of this uncertainty. Yeah. And this, this goes full circle back to Wimbledon, right? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Because then um, na- now with increased uncertainty, you have folks going risk off. Right. And that has a cascading effect on the rest of the economy. Right. That's um, right. So uh, right. Th- then I think, though, that, okay, if, if we said, hey, look, the Fed, you've got to handcuff yourself to the Taylor rule. Yeah. And they would have yeah. raised rates. When they were saying inflation is transitory, they would, if they were following that rule, they would have had to raise rates. Right, right. Um, and then it's like if that rule is a rule that is imposed or, you know, artificial. Yeah. Then they're going to want – there's going to be tremendous pressure to break that rule. Right. And so it becomes kind of an institutional question of, hey, like the Fed's not actually 100% independent. Like <laughs> they still have to – Right. Uh, and that's I think this is where we get to Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Of okay, well, is it are are there any examples of central banks actually binding themselves to a rule uh and sticking to it? I mean, I know there's like currency boards with Steve Hank is a huge yeah. fan of. But. Yeah, yeah. I have not seen any example and I have little faith that any central bank would be able to make that commitment. Why is the two percent inflation target not a sufficient rule? So I, I uh so so I think um and then they have the natural rate of unemployment as right. well as kind of the other, those two rules. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess the uh, the issue is that the there's still uh, I mean, the community of of macroeconomists can't agree on what that number is. So whether it's two percent or three percent and four or five or one percent, and because of that, they just can't settle on a single rule to to adopt, and then no rule gets chosen, and then we're back in the, into this this uh, prisoner's dilemma of using just discretionary monetary management right because then they'll even they'll go one percent one year and they're like well we need to catch it up next right. year by going to three percent yeah and so it's not actually a rule where hey if you break the rule you have to go back to sticking to it <laughs> right, instead right. it's like this weird right. uh, rationalization of whatever they wanted to actually do yeah uh, that's right do, do, doing that um is yep. it, uh, it? Do you think it's a performance incentive problem as well? <laughs> of like, if you guys stick to this rule, you'll get this bonus. Yeah. So you know that that brings up this the, your earlier point about how independent is the Fed, and I was always uh, surprised to to you know based on my again my experience in the in the Bush administration is that the Fed did seem to care a little too much about political sentiment, and partly it's it's I think it's. Um, Maybe I mean well I mean the justification is that you could this is what they would say I guess or the people in office is um, uh, th- you know maybe it was it was you have this you f- have this weight on your shoulders as a policymaker that you feel like all these lives are at your hands because there's a recession coming and and you have to make these decisions and um, and that was always the justification for why the policymaker wants to pander to the politics that I was told that I would hear yeah and um, and it's it's you know it's unfortunate but. What happens in these positions is that I think people start as, as academics, as intellectuals in the ivory tower with, with good principles. And then when they get into the hot seat, they begin to buckle to these political pressures and they begin to care about what the, what the, what will, what the Wall Street Journal will say on their newspa- in the newspaper about the, the rates rather than what they would feel is the, the best thing for the economy at the time. Right. Yeah. And it, uh, it, it's also true that at the end of the day, the legitimacy of those institutions rests on consent of the governed. Yeah. And so – on some level, uh, they're not uh, able to disconnect themselves from the politics. Right. Um, okay. So yeah, if we bring it to Bitcoin, yeah, I'm yeah. really because yeah. I it's uh, to me this is a fascinating area uh-huh. of like I just see the the outcomes of the fiat monetary system are inevitable, and we can you know try to stop that you know and and kind of uh, uh, be involved in activism and to you know lobby them to to not do that, but uh, the incentives are such that hey they've they're they've got the ability to um, wield this power and print money. On the Bitcoin side, I also find it fascinating that the monetary policy, the rule, is set by the Bitcoin nodes, and the beneficiaries of the rule of hey we're going to add. S- Today it's six point two five Bitcoin every ten minutes. Are a separate entity, which is the miners, right? And that it's essentially a very interesting like check and balance, like yeah. 
uh, where the nodes can veto the reward going to the miners. Right. And then you've got the protocol rules of, you know, what's a valid block yeah. included in that is this inflation rate. Yeah. And the, that separation of powers uh -huh. doesn't exist in the fiat system. And it's almost like if, if one vote in the House uh -huh. could veto a Fed, you know, printing more money. Right. It's basically what Bitcoin's right. structure is. Yeah. And so your outcome would be, all right, well, no money is ever going to get printed, <laughs> right? Because you'll have that one person, I won't name names, you know, yeah. like Matt Gates, uh, yeah. who will, you know, veto uh, spending uh, this money, whether yeah. fiscally or monetarily, right? I, I like that framework you, you just uh, put forward. I actually hadn't thought of that before, the separation between the miners and the and the, the nodes. Uh, it's something that we saw in the block size wars, right? The, yeah. that, that separation. And I think you're right. That Bitcoin is better off for that. Because yeah. I, I remember when we were talking about the block size wars, like there was an argument that um, it's okay for the miners to centralize to the point that they have both of those roles. They're a node and miner, and that's right. all that counts. And right. the, the argument that I heard was that they wouldn't increase the money supply. They wouldn't like stop the having from happening uh -huh. because it would cause the price of Bitcoin to go down uh -huh. such that they would actually be penalizing themselves. Right, right. But that seems to miss the Cantillon effect. Yeah. That, you know, they create the Bitcoin for themselves and then the distribution out will eventually cause the Bitcoin price to go down, but they're the first spenders. Right, right. So right, they have right. this disproportionate benefit. Yeah, that's right. Benefit. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that is an interesting... Um, Question. I think there was a time when uh, uh, this must have been the. Uh, wasn't there a time when you might know better than me that there was uh, uh, some of the miners tried to freeze the subsidy and yeah. then it, it it forked into some nonsense coin that went nowhere. I didn't know about the fork part, but okay. I knew about a, a mailing list conversation. I think it was before the 2012 halving, the first halving. Okay, okay. Where some miners were like, hey, is this like required or like can we... <laughs> right, the halving, right? Yeah, yeah, do we have to do this? It <laughs> seems like a bad feature to have. <laughs> Let's patch it. Right, um, right. And uh, there being kind of a kerfuffle over okay, it. Okay, uh, okay. Because already, you know, at that point, it's, you know, people call it a subsidy, right? Because that's just, I think that's the terminology Satoshi yeah. gave it. Yeah. Um, but in some ways, it, it kind of does create that lo logic of thinking on the recipient's part of like, hey, I'm entitled to this. <laughs> uh, you can't just take half, away, uh, half of it away. Right, right, um, right, right. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but I think the broader point is that, um, you know, the, I, I think that the macro point is simply that what distinguishes Bitcoin 100% from our fiat world that we've, is the first time we've got this fixed money supply uh, and predictable and unchangeable that really is, is really unique. And it, and it seemed back to, Back to Ed Prescott in 2004, his Nobel Prize, that was exactly the criteria that is the only thing that would maintain rational expectations in the market, is that it's predictable and it's un unchangeable. And Bitcoin has both of those properties. And I, I think it's the first time ever that we've ever had any money like that. Even gold, you could say, doesn't have those two properties. So, yeah. Rational expectations. Now we're kind of getting, let's let's talk about efficient markets. Yeah, yeah, for and sure. is the having price in. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So I, I am a Chicago guy, so I do believe in efficient markets. Um, strong, weak, medium? Uh, pretty strong. Yeah, pretty okay. strong. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, yeah, I, I, it's, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying that there aren't some people who have skill. You know, yeah. there are a few people in the economy who have skill. I'm not one of them, and most people are not one of them. Um, uh, and I think the vast, the size of the financial sector most of the people are also not one of them. And so there's way too much uh, uh, human capital and uh, financial capital going into chasing alpha that probably just shouldn't do it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in my opinion, yeah, at a first order express, at four, I do believe that prices are efficient, yeah. Bitcoin's a little unique because it's, 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 it's uh, I guess this is where you really need a strong form because the, uh, it's, it's a more complex product than just the stock of a company. And I think uh, the reason I'm in Bitcoin education is, is, my, is my mission is to teach people about this and to understand how it works so they can decide for themselves. And I'm always surprised how little students and, and most people I know know about what Bitcoin is. It's just that they kind of rely just on what's in the media about, about it. Yeah. It's, it's paradoxical because Bitcoin in many regards is more transparent than a publicly traded company right. in being open source. Yeah. All the code is out there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but... 
not everyone knows that that's even the case, right? Right? Yeah. They, they think there's a Bitcoin CEO, a Bitcoin corporation. <laughs> right, right, yeah. exactly right. Exa and, and the fact that all the transactions are on the blockchain, and not only are they public, they're in everybody's hard drives of all these nodes. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it, it, I always have to smile when I hear people complain about the anonymity of, you know, of, of Bitcoin. And well, so that part, and with FTX, yeah. I found it shocking that nobody watching on chain had deduced that they didn't have any Bitcoin. <laughs> and when they claimed to have billions, right? right and right, so right. the materiality threshold there, I'm like, it should be way past, like, it, it should have been throwing red flags at chain analysis, yeah, right? Of yeah, like, yeah. hey, this entity, Bitcoin comes in, Bitcoin comes out, but nothing's staying here. <laughs> right. You know, right, right. it's SVF's got like an empty ship here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But despite, um, I mean, maybe I'm making an argument against Bitcoin's transparency here, but yeah. um, I thought that was a very interesting quirk of, hey, uh, you know, chain analysis holds itself out there. It's right. like, hey, we have total visibility, but it seems right. like. Right. The, the perfect information is not being synthesized, analyzed, yeah. communicated in some way. Yeah, um, yeah. So in terms of, uh, okay, so here's my theory on, yeah, on why the halving is not priced in. Uh -huh, uh -huh. There's uh, information is created by the passage of time. Yeah, yeah. And so the information of th that, that the halving has happened doesn't exist before the halving has happened. <laughs> Is that <laughs> is that too so, too clever of a yeah. because yeah, there's a yeah. difference between knowing something will happen and something have it, that it, it has yeah. happened. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so I understand that they're not even discounting the uncertainty. Let's say you've got total certainty. Right. Right. It's just a different quality of information due to the passage of time. So okay, I the, I guess I will that okay. I'll, I'll be frank. That that argument seems a little bit. Little, little loosey goosey, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah. I think you could make the argument that maybe the having is not priced in because the marginal investor in the market, who generally sets the price, that marginal investor may not really fully understand or enough about Bitcoin to understand what the having well, having is. We know he doesn't understand it because yeah. he went on TV. Jamie Dimon, <laughs> right. Jamie Dimon said, "What if they just create more Bitcoin?" Right, right. And that's he's right. the marginal buyer. I mean, yeah, let's, yeah, uh, let's, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's where. And I, but I've also heard uh, from the efficient markets perspective that hey, not everyone has to be fully understanding of you know that. But that, that to me, that, 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 that means that we're moving away from strong, efficient markets if we're starting to talk yeah. about the bounded rationality of the marginal buyer. Right. And the information asymmetry. Yeah, that's right. Because then, well, who has perfect information if you're saying the marginal buyer has an asymmetry here? Yeah. How to model that? Yeah. And then the other argument I, I, I see in the mining industry as well yeah. is the cash flow, kind of flow of funds argument, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. That hey, until there's an actual flow of funds to move the price, uh -huh. it can't get priced in. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And in the mining cycle, we, we see this as well of um, perhaps the reason why the halving is a catalyst um, is one, fewer miners selling Bitcoin into the market. Right. And two, fewer miners investing in CapEx. Yeah. And then that means that th that flow of funds now gets redirected to the second best opportunity, Spot Bitcoin, right, right and so right, then right. you are pushing up spot Bitcoin. But uh -huh. um, I think it's a fascinating area. Oh yeah. yeah, and so maybe I guess maybe that the having is just a proxy for do people understand the full scarcity and the true scarcity of, of Bitcoin? And that to me, I don't think that's true. I don't think people have really grokked it because it is it is unique in that sense, and uh, and especially for something digital, right? It, it's kind of this cognitive dissonance. You think, well, how can something digital be scarce, right? Right. But yeah. That is the the that is the unique the unique uh, feature of, of Bitcoin, yeah. Uh, and I, I had, uh, until I heard Michael Saylor say it, and I'd been in Bitcoin for many years right. when I heard him say it, of uh, you own a fixed percentage of the supply. You own one twenty-one millionth right. as a percentage of the supply forever. And that that struck a chord in me of like, the, I hadn't thought of it that way. Right, that's As right. a percentage of the supply rather than like as one Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. That's right. The way the way it, it um, the, the the light bulb for me came. I was I was drawing uh, supply and demand for 
Bitcoin versus gold for my class. And I just realized the supply of Bitcoin is just never changing. So all the action on the price is going to come from changes in demand. And um, in any other market, right, when, say, the price of gold go goes up, that's going to shift the supply curve and more miner gold miners are going to enter the market to mine gold because the price is high. And you've got these two things moving at once. You've got the demand and the supply. And Bitcoin, you only have the demand moving and supply right. is fixed. And that was that was my moment where that my aha moment. It's like wow, this is really unique. Yeah, yeah the uh, the difficulty adjustment, right? Absorbing all of that yeah. energy. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Exactly, probably the greatest innovation within Bitcoin. Yeah, um, yeah, and I've I've heard it argued. I think it was Peter Todd who said that's the only innovation. <laughs> yeah, I, I would. I, for me, I wouldn't say that. I mean, to me, the, the the combination of all the technologies in one is 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 really amazing. I mean, that, yeah. The that, system integration. The system yeah. integration was it was uh, it, to me that's non-trivial. I mean, if, for for someone to say that that that's that's to me discounting system integration, right? Which yeah. is is so much of the value of what you know most a lot of innovation is is pulling ideas together. But the computer scientists they don't like the engineering. So <laughs> right, 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 right. I to see them that. it's yeah yeah that's an implementation detail. Right, <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but you know, even I would I would challenge anyone who says that you know. Build Bitcoin yourself from scratch, and just right. and, and just just see how you can do it. Even even with what we know today, right? Uh, just build version zero point one yourself. Pick a language; doesn't have to be C plus plus, and see if you can get version zero point one to work on release the way Satoshi did. I, I mean, that's a high bar. It is. I would say I don't know. I don't. I mean, maybe the core developers could do it, but I I don't know if people. I don't. No one really has done that. You know, like to rebuild the entire thing from scratch. Um, you know? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think that they've. And, and in a vacuum, even like th that, it is astonishing what what Satoshi accomplished. Uh -huh. um, there were some bugs revealed yeah, afterwards, yeah, but yeah. that is to but, be expected. Oh, uh, right, yeah. And that they could be fixed, right? I think that the uh, evolutionary aspect of the technology of like bugs have been fixed, upgrades have happened. Yeah, and even that is very hard of building a decentralized system that is going to be able to have upgrades happen yeah yeah exactly right that's right no you're i mean yeah exactly yeah um all right so satoshi's a genius just beyond the, <laughs> the uh, difficulty adjustment yeah um, yeah we'll give him lots of credit yeah. uh and i agree nobody smarter has come along <laughs> since right. maybe uh i think that there's one person that or let's say two peter yeah. people uh taj Dreja, yep. who yep. uh was kind of instrumental and, and kind of one of the the big brains behind lightning and dlcs uh discrete log contracts uh -huh. of trying to create like essentially prediction mark on top yeah. of Bitcoin, which um and then of course peter woolley and uh right. and, you know with uh segwit and taproot yeah and, um yeah you know, i know greg maxwell and yeah. luke dasher and all that were, were involved but um yeah we got a deep venture talent uh, oh yeah but yeah, we do, uh, we do, satoshi yeah. i mean it was definitely on another level on another level for and, sure yeah the mystery of it, I think, on the human terms, is also just fascinating. Of yeah, like, just disappeared, didn't move any Bitcoin. Right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and probably that probably is great for Bitcoin. You know, yeah. the, but I will say, I wish you know. I guess again, as an educator, I think the, the the genesis of Bitcoin, no pun intended, is it's a deeply moving and inspiring story of human achievement. I mean, it just the, you know one of the greatest innovations of our time. The fact that this is possible, that human beings were able to create this is uh i i think it's 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 just a, it's like a testament to the power of in invention and of innovation of uh ingenuity and so the more i wish i knew more about that yeah you know, just as to, to inspire myself and my students you know um i think that w something that 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 is really important that i uh have brought up before but yeah. i'll bring up again which is that he wrote the code before he wrote the white paper right Right. And I think that's really uh, I think that's inspiring as yeah, well of yeah, like, yeah, yeah, folks get hung up on the, whether their idea is good or not. Right. And it's like, well, try it out. Yeah, like, exactly. Put right. pen to paper. Exactly right. I definitely f uh, that's resonates with me as an academic because we're always just writing papers. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> you yeah. know, and uh, yeah, exactly right. That's uh, that's 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 a great model for all for all of us. Well, I mean, even from an academic perspective, it's like run the experiment before right. you write the paper. Because yeah. Because yeah. I think that you know where science can get politicized is when people start with the conclusion, right? Exactly write the paper right. and then back into what is the data that supports that. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's right. And you know, in my my class, uh, my Bitcoin protocol class, uh, 
the other thing what I've I've learned and my students learn also is that you learn so much from the act of writing in this co- whether it's code or whether it's English you know yeah. but but from the writing the code and actually getting it to, to work it's just a lot of a lot of light bulbs that go off you know? yeah. Um, yeah and and lots of uh, thorny issues like yeah the uh, Bitcoin protocol has some some sharp corners sometimes yeah, yeah um, that's right yeah. Uh, including, I think recently somebody accidentally paid a giant transaction fee to a mining pool uh-huh, uh-huh. accidentally by not including an output, <laughs> and so the residual amount. Oh you know, goes wow, to the, the miner must have been happy. Yeah, yeah. Although the F two pool decided to it, return it. Oh, uh, they did. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, and we can discuss whether that's a bailout and like <laughs> go back to the question of rules, right? Right. Like, right. Right. Do yeah. we have rules here? Yeah. Or not? Yeah. Um, that's right. It was yeah. kind of a uh, quote unquote altruistic yeah. uh, thing. Yeah. But. Um, in any case, okay, so I'm really curious now as to, you know, you you, you taught a protocol course last semester. Yeah. This semester you taught two courses. Yes, yes. I'm teaching uh, the protocol class again, and I'm also teaching a new class in the business school on Bitcoin. And that's a, a brand new class that is designed um, to teach Bitcoin in a, in a no-code version for no, and a non-technical for business students. I'm trying to close the gap that I perceive between a technical understanding of Bitcoin and the, the popular understanding of Bitcoin. There's an ocean of distance between these two levels. And uh, I actually think there's a huge opportunity here to try to scale this across other universities or across the public to try to get people to understand what Bitcoin actually is and how it works. And I think if, if, if the educators had done this or if they do this, that will probably uh, forestall a lot of the problems we have in the altcoin communities. Because uh, people don't just don't know what Bitcoin is and how, how, how what the feature what the true features are. So essentially, that ninety five percent of people have heard the word Bitcoin, right? But they think of it as a ticker symbol. Yeah, as, yeah. Uh, just a an exchange rate. Exactly right. That's right. They just and they just they don't know what it is. They just think of it as just as as something you trade, something you buy, or, buy or sell or trade. And uh, what I do, we don't talk about the price of Bitcoin at all in my class. We, uh, we go, um, well, you know, the way I, I like to frame it is that, you know, I would say the, the common understanding of, of Bitcoin, like a more educated understanding of Bitcoin is, well, maybe someone knows about the blockchain and how it works and, and about miners. And that would be a good baseline, which a lot of students don't even have. Oh. Uh, but we want to go two levels beneath. We want to go to transactions, the actual contents of each block. And then within transactions, we want to talk about the cryptography, about signatures and, on, and the private and public keys. And, and I think those, those ideas should be part of general education. I mean, everyone in, out of high school should be able to understand these things, actually. And in 20 years, we may get there. And, uh, and I think we'd be better off for it. Right. Yeah. I agree. Because if so, you know, you went in one direction. Yeah. If we go in the other direction of above the ticker symbol, <laughs> it's like it's like memes and narratives. Right. right. Of like cultural. And if you just looked at the news reporting around Bitcoin, you would kind of assume that efficient market would put this asset at zero dollars. Right? right. That it's right. literally it's Beanie Babies <laughs> minus the physical presence of the beanie baby yeah. of like having a stuffy. And yeah, so yeah. it's uh it's a combination of zero utility and purely speculative at that level. And so it raises the question of, okay, well if Bitcoin's trading at twenty eight thousand dollars, what's below that that is supporting <laughs> the price and pushing it right, you know, through multiple cycles. Yeah. Um it's not like this is the pump part of a pump and dump, right? Right, right. Well, Pierre, let me ask you. Let me yeah. ask you. I mean, you've been you've been active as a as a Bitcoin uh, educator yourself. Um, what is your opinion of the, the popular understanding of Bitcoin, and what what opportunities are there, or, or do you think, or, or challenges going forward? Yeah, I I think that uh, I share your view on it entirely, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, which is that, and and it's something that that I, I try to bring up a lot, which is that. Bitcoin has fundamentals that are supported by software engineering. Yeah. And that it's not just an arbitrary social construct right. of, oh, here's a convention we're going to use in order to build a Ponzi scheme or something right, like that. Right, right. Um, and that um, the popular understanding of it, too, I think that in order to make that phase transition from price and speculation to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the underlying value. Mm-hmm. There's the education part, and then there's the use part yeah. of 
that that light bulb moment of sending a, or receiving a lightning payment, right? And having the realization that I didn't have to depend on a third party for this. Right. It was peer to peer. Yeah. Yeah. And this is electronic cash, a bare instrument. Yeah. And kind of the actually doing it, having it, using it, um, where we don't have to understand how an internal combustion engine works right. when we get in the car. Right. We just understand what it's going to do. And it's not a question of like the education question shifts from how does an internal combustion engine work? Yeah. To how do I change gears and like steer right, and right. follow the traffic signals yeah, that's right. uh, of driver's ed? And I think that um, both are absolutely necessary because ultimately in order to get to the driver's ed part, people, because we're talking about money, yeah, people want to have confidence in what the system is. That's right. And kind of, uh, yeah, that's, here's what the gasoline is doing. Right. Right. Yes, there's an explosion happening, but yeah. it's happening in a very well engineered system. Yes, yes. And that would that that uh, we're not there yet at that no. level of education, no. right? We're we're um so people are really just it's too much of a black box. We don't you don't have to be able to understand the details of finite fields to understand Bitcoin, but at least know what the big pieces are. Yeah. And that's where we want to move towards. Yeah. And and on a use part, I also think we're still early of like we're like pre-model T. Yeah. In yeah, the sense yeah. of, yeah, you're gonna have to do like maintenance on your car. Like right. you're gonna have to go in the command line and you're gonna have right. to, you know, do some things to do a multi-sync. <laughs> right. Like uh we and I know there's lots of fantastic companies that are working on this, but yeah. I don't think that we've yet seen kind of the the next leap in terms of usability that would really get people interacting with Bitcoin or have a a use case, you know, that is so uniquely enabled by Bitcoin that it just draws people in. Yeah, yeah. You know, so one, that, that brings up a, a, another question, actually, I, I want to ask you, yeah. get your opinion on, which is, to me, this is kind of a, the existential philosophical debate on Bitcoin, which is, um, what is the the best path to adoption? And and, and let me just simplify it yeah. with two, this kind of this, uh, uh, make it simple. Like One would be the, the principled, pure path of sound money, and educating people on the errors of central banking. Uh, and the other would be, say, the Trojan horse argument, where you don't focus on the sound money because that's too abstract or too boring for most people, and instead get them engaged on uh, behaviors, uh, features of Bitcoin that Bitcoin could, could serve, whether that's prediction markets or, uh, or, or gambling or casinos and all these other uh, possibilities, and then kind of, kind of uh, Trojan horse them in for sound money in the long term. What, what do you? I'd like to hear your. your yeah, opinion. that's a great question. So, um, I think that uh, the, for me personally, yeah. the sound money argument resonated because I was already Rothbardian, hundred percent reserve yeah. gold and silver. You know, yeah, uh, Austrian. Right. So for me, it was just like, OK, this is strictly better than gold, because as we discussed, gold is getting, you know, right. mined far at a, at a greater rate than Bitcoin is now. Yeah. Um, so that intuitively made sense to me. And, 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 and I think that the, the reason why I really got bullish on Bitcoin. Yeah wasn't so much the ideological angle of it as connecting the ideological to the fact that there's going to be an adoption mechanism here where ideologically, I do believe the sound money wins. Right. And I do think that weaker monies ultimately get destroyed and replaced by sounder monies over time. Yeah. And I actually think that's the story of, uh, and this is controversial with the gold people of right. like, the dollar has these inst set of institutions that we've been discussing yeah. that um, make up for the so so the 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 technology of a hundred dollar bill um, and you being allowed to verify that with a cash counting machine yeah where you can authenticate that this is a real hundred dollar bill yeah was a technological breakthrough that made it such that the dollar is able to be a sounder money than gold. Uh, despite its flaws. And I know this can be hugely controversial for folks, but yeah, yeah. Um, that's why I think that the dollar ultimately did win in the, f 
in the free market against right. gold. Right, right, um, right. Otherwise, I mean, look, the truth is that the dollar would not be the world reserve currency if I was wrong. I don't think there, there's a way for, I, I, like, I, I really don't believe the, the, let's call them conspiracy theories of, like, the U.S. government forcing the rest of the world to be on the dollar standard yeah. instead of on gold yeah, um, yeah, or on silver or euros, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that there are uh, network effects that create a dominant currency that is the soundest currency from a broad perspective right. of total transaction costs, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, in kind of the academic sense of transaction costs, uh, which includes the institutional context and all this. And that Bitcoin is superior to the dollar. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that the more people adopt Bitcoin, the faster its uh, uh, its purchasing power increases. Right, right. And that then you get a, a cycle, right, of, well, you've got the momentum traders, yeah. you've got the leverage players, and then you have the rebalancers, yeah, the people yeah. who are then selling at these higher, you know, uh, parabolic prices yeah. that cause the market to crash that drive away adoption. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. push adoption away. In a normal technological upgrade, let's say iPhones, yeah. you don't have this phenomenon of people speculating on iPhones, accumulating them, hoarding iPhones, and then dumping them onto the market and driving away iPhone adoption, right? <laughs> because Apple can just ramp up their factory in right. China and instead of producing 10 million, they'll produce 100 million. Right, right. Because it's commodity. Yeah. In, yeah. in you know, this commodity sense of being manufacturable. Whereas Bitcoin's a scarcity, right? Yeah. That we yeah. can't, we don't have that ramping capability. All of it has to flow through the price, the right. exchange rate, you know, the purchasing power. And that causes psychological second order effects. Yeah. Yeah. That create these bear markets where adoption is suppressed. Yeah. Until the next bull market. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. But it's kind of, I see it as like in between. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that there's the, the ideological argument that sound money is inevitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you should buy Bitcoin because of that. Uh huh. And then there's the speculative argument that this is going to go through speculative cycles and there's nothing we can do about that. Right, but right. That speculation will drive adoption and suppress it in the yeah. bear market so so just like you i mean i i am also partial to the sound money argument um at the same time i would say that you know in in the, you know we have the last we're in we're in 100 years plus in um uh, in, with central banks right yeah. and i think uh, i noticed that you know people uh among the population among students no one really uh maybe now after the pandemic they're beginning to do it but historically they have not seen central banks as a problem, that's just not a thing, right? It's not. It's not one of the top five problems in the world. If you ask your, you know, your parents or a lot of people you, still think the dollar is backed by gold, right? Like in yeah, survey data, yeah, exactly like right. They, there's this momentum. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's just massive, massive miseducation on on how money, what money is, and how it works. And so um, I think I think I haven't still made up my. I mean, I am primarily. I mean, as a role, as an intellectual, as an academic, an educator, obviously. You know, universities should be pushing the the pure narrative as much as they can. Um, but also, I'm as an as kind of a rational economist, I am curious. You know, is is the pure narrative actually the best path to adoption versus these other other strategies? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that um, nobody's going to adopt sound money if it's against their self interest. Yeah, right, right. And uh, so I think that you have to believe that adopting a sound money is in your self interest. In order, even I would argue, in order to be a sound money proponent, right? <laughs> yeah, Otherwise, yeah, you'd be yeah. like, well, no, I mean, nobody right. nobody wants to hold good money, so <laughs> yeah, there's not yeah. going to be good money, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, empirically. Um, and and the, then it becomes a question of short-term versus long-term of like, are you – because if you're thinking about it short-term of like, I'm going to get rich quick, right, right. You're probably going to get disappointed because you're going to have those thoughts at $70,000. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's and right. – uh, just as in traditional financial markets, people want to take on more risk in the bull market. Yeah, yeah. At the top, that's right. Then they want to at the bottom when it's rational to, right. to do so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So I think that it has to like I'm opposed to ever taking the short term approach of yeah. like trying to convince people they're going to get rich quick. Yeah, yeah. Versus like, hey, this is long term savings technology. 
Yeah. And you want to be like dollar cost averaging into yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think the other point is that on the sound money part, if you start telling people, hey, this is going to replace the US dollar, I think viscerally there's people who are like, hey, look, like the dollar is good for this country. Right. Like, right. Right. A lot of a lot of uh, politicians view that way. Yeah. Right. Like they, they will. Even even the ones that are sympathetic to Bitcoin, at, at, at some point, if you start threatening the dollar, like well, they they see that as unpatriotic, right? Yeah. Somehow, and it's but it, it's also an open question uh, on the academic side. Of yeah. What are the costs and benefits of having the global reserve currency, and are the benefits greater than the costs? <laughs> right. Like, right. Right. That is in debate. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what what seems to be what, what I'm, I'm surprised what isn't in debate is is you know should the central bank even be should it exist right we, 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 which was a debate 50 years ago but somehow we've lost having that debate you know even 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 if I mean we have papers that are that are that come through Texas A and M like all universities uh, macroeconomics and microeconomics which assume that you know the the cent- there's a baseline assumption the central bank knows what it's doing yeah yeah. Yeah, it, it, you know, before my my hope was like, oh, Ron Paul is going to audit the Fed. Yeah. And uh, we're going to switch back to the gold standard. Um, and Hayek had this quote of a sly roundabout way of yeah. replacing the fiat system with something new. Uh-huh. It was kind of the only hope rather than uh, actually reforming it fr- from the inside. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's this this big overarching question of, how do you have that without disrupting the economy? Right, right. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. the you know, do you see it as like just education, like that that will smooth the path, or that hey, there's going to be volatility and there's going to be disruption? Yeah, I think there will be. I mean, that's I, I would say my view is the latter that there there will there will be disrupt just like any any secular change in the in the economy, uh, even trade. You can think of free, a free trade is that that great example. Yeah. The, that we are going to be better off. There's going to be some short-term dislocation, and we, as a society, we have to agree that it's worth the short-term pain to get to the long-term benefit. Um, so, uh, for so for me, that that's an, maybe I'm being excessively callous about it or too yeah. rational, but um, I would hope that the political system would would not hijack this process and interrupt the long term for the sake of the short term. Yeah, I guess I always react to it of um, whenever we have historical examples of liberalization. Yeah, that you. The, the the cost is quickly forgotten. Yeah, and yeah. It was it, it, and then with the benefit of hindsight, right. like when we see the benefits afterwards, it's like okay, well, you know, you'd have to really look into the footnotes of the history book of like, yeah. hey, there was like six months of like higher unemployment. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, a great example of that is is uh, you know, you look at how the mechanization of farming in the U.S. And what we had such a large, I used to have the number off the top of my head, I don't anymore, but in 1900, a, mo- a very, very large fraction of the U.S. labor force was in farming. And when tractors came to the farms, it put all these farmers out of work, right? Yeah. I mean, they, uh, you know, some of them became like entrepreneurs and, and, lo- and started running these large farms, but a lot of them just, just lost work. But what happened is that that created the information age, all, it all fed all the people that ev- eventually went into f- services, uh, some of them financial services, and, uh, and it created this whole new industry. And looking back, we don't, we don't see or care even about that short-term dislocation, and that's the view I think yeah. we should have. You yeah, know, we should like let's. How would this look from a hundred years looking back? Okay, yeah. so let's say let's. Okay, yeah. Jeremy Powell's out of a job. Right? Yeah, he's yeah. gonna have to go right. back to work on Wall Street. I think yeah, is where he was yeah, yeah, right. Um, but is there still a commercial banking system yeah. and financial system and financial intermediation in a world where? Everybody's hoarding money because it's increasing in value, and they're not lending it out, which is kind of you know the right. the the uh, um, maybe the extreme argument against Bitcoin of like, hey, look, how are we going to finance an economy right. with a deflationary currency? Right. Like, do you, uh, how do you see financial intermediation working? Yeah, that's an interesting topic, and it's actually something that I'm writing a book about. So I'm I'm still in the early stages. Um, I do believe that there will be lending and, and financialization in the future yeah. on a Bitcoin standard, but we have to think about what that looks like. And I think uh, just like Satoshi did, we can design a system that would make sense and, and take advantages of Bitcoin that doesn't involve uh, a lot of Bitcoin paper, doesn't involve even a central bank. But we have to be a little bit more upfront about what that looks like. Uh, so I, I'm actually confident, maybe optimistic uh, that it is possible, um, it, and and it's up to people like us to to try to articulate what that future looks like. Yeah. 
Yeah, that I'm looking forward to reading the book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, and yeah. Um, so other than uh, the courses, writing the book. Yeah. Um, I know you, that you are one of the founding members of the Blockchain and Energy Research Consortium. Yes, yes, yes. So th thank you for bringing that up. So Texas A&M, as you know, has a really, really long history of knowledge and human capital in the energy business. Um, uh, the father of fracking, George Mitchell, was was from Texas A&M. Uh, and so we have lots of human capital on campus uh, to study energy. And uh, I, uh, in my my I, my Bitcoin conference that I held two years ago, I recruited several engineering faculty, uh, and, I, and I told them, look, this is one of the most exciting areas that's happening in Texas. And uh, as of now, I think around 15 to 17% of, of, of hash rate, uh, global Bitcoin hash rate is happening in Texas alone. And so it's a booming industry. It's a booming area. And so uh, we launched this, this research consortium to, uh, to understand and take an academic perspective on all the issues around Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. Yeah. Um, that's, and I, I've, uh, I've really benefited from that. Yeah. Uh, I know yeah. that uh, Steve Kennard from TBC introduced yeah. us, uh, yes. and TBC, Texas Blockchain Council has really played an instrumental role in kind of catalyzing the, right. um, the partnerships in this area. That's right. And we appreciate Riot's support of that, of that, yeah. uh, the, the consortium. Um, yeah. and I, just participating in it and, and going yeah. out to College Station and yeah. to the Relis campus, I mean, I've learned so much from the students at Texas A&M, from the professors, um, in kind of drawing from, they, they have so much experience in electrical engineering. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. then yourself in, you know, financial economics and, yeah. and all of the, these areas where they're directly relevant to the industry. Uh -huh. That's what I love about it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this isn't, you know, the caricature of academia we have of like, yeah, they're kind of like in their own world. No, this is uh, directly relevant to conversations we're having with policymakers right. internally with engineering teams of, you know, what we're building. Um, so it is really exciting to kind of see that fusion. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I hope that two big things will come out of this. So uh, one is the research that we'll be able to analyze I mean, this is what universities should be doing is, is think about problems that the rest of the world doesn't have the time or the incentives to to pursue and yeah. so everyone you know the, the the industry is busy you know firefighting and solving their problems in in operating in the real markets and we have the luxury uh to kind of take a step back and ask you know what is the best either design of a uh, uh an ancillary service program from ERCOT or uh what bitcoin mining uh what the industry how it's evolving in, in within texas uh, to ask those and answer those questions. Um, and the second thing we want I want to see happen is to grow the, the talent pool. And so this is the other big benefit. We are uh, the second largest university in the U.S., the, 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 uh, the fastest growing in the Southwest. I thought y'all were the largest. I think we now maybe, by some measures, by some measures yeah. we are the our largest. Yeah. I mean, the, the at least, you know, over 70,000 students, yeah. uh, you know, 20,000 alone in engineering. So this growing industry is going to need people, and so yeah. you know I'm hoping that we can train, you know, help train that next generation of students who will become your your colleagues in the future. Yeah, and I, I know that we've had a lot of very successful, um, I mean, full time hires and interns as well. We run an yeah. internship program every summer, so yeah, um, it's it's been really excellent to see, and it's also close by uh, just you, geographically. Oh yeah, um, that matters too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, between our facility in Rockdale, right. College Station, and then uh, Round Rock. Um, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and the Aggies are great kids. I mean, you know, I, that's why I'm there. Honestly, I love the student. More, you know, th I would say the research pays the bills, but the, the students win my heart, and they yeah. really are great kids. I mean, they're like some of the best kids uh, I've ever. I mean, I've taught all over the place. I've taught at Chicago, at Georgetown, George Washington, and hands down, the students at A and M are my favorite. And I would. You know, I want to die on that campus. You know, I I, I have yeah. them uh, over my house all the time, and they are. Uh, I think if we can encourage them to to walk into this new frontier, then that's the, one of the best things we can do for them. Yeah, and I think that it, it intuitively will click for them. Uh, you know, given the the culture there and like the having kind of a, a vision for Texas for energy, yeah, um, and for sound money that um, it, there's it's it's ripe. Um, yeah. The the other question um, I was going to have was kind of going forward. Yeah. Where, where do you see things going like longer term with Texas A&M or with, with Bitcoin with, or, you know, with Texas A&M, but um, even with like Bitcoin mining in Texas. Yeah. Uh, and. And then at a macro level, of, yeah. 
this is a question I wanted to ask earlier yeah. when we were talking about adoption. Yeah. Do people get pushed out of the dollar system? Yeah. Because it, things are going poorly. Yeah. Or do they get pulled into the Bitcoin system because, you know, n number go up and like that question of like push versus pull. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was yeah. a lot of questions there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, uh, okay. So let's, let me take the, the, the yeah. big question first. I am optimistic about Bitcoin. Um, I don't, I don't presume to know when the timing of adoption will happen, when that tipping point will occur. I do believe that it certainly can grow from where it is now. You know, even even it were it to displace, I think it can very easily displace the uh, the the market cap of gold, right? right. Which is what that thirteen trillion or so, um, a big chunk which is public, the rest is private. It can certainly get to that level. I think even in our lifetimes, uh, to the point where central banks start holding Bitcoin in addition to gold. Um, now, now, once you start eclipsing store of value into medium of exchange, that is, um, I think that's also winnable. And I probably believe that, that it'll happen through technology. So Bitcoin, I believe, has a great edge on, on, on technology. And if you look at the other coins, there's no one really that's competing with Bitcoin for the purposes of, uh, of store of value and medium of exchange. I mean, everyone else is trying to do different things with different applications. Yeah. Some of them are questionable. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but it seems like people have ceded ground to Bitcoin as, as the, the king of that realm. Yeah. Um, I think the, um, you know, uh, so for me, the question mark is, can human beings release, uh, the release control of the central bank? Can we live without a central bank? Uh, we've done that before in the U.S., but it was over 100 years ago. And uh, I do believe it is possible. I do think we need more education and we need to, uh, to talk about what that looks like because 100 years is a long time and everyone we know, I, I don't know anyone really who was around before 1913, uh, everyone we know lived in the world of the, of the Federal Reserve. And so it's going um, to take some convincing and some th hard thinking to, to, to get there. Um, and... Uh, uh, that may not ha may or may not happen in, in our lifetime. So, uh, but I am optimistic that we are moving moving in that direction. I don't I don't want I don't want to presume that I can pick pinpoint when exactly and how because yeah. were I to do that in some level, I would be no different than the central bankers who are trying to predict the money supply yeah. right? <laughs> and can predict the macroeconomy. Yeah. Uh, as for Texas, I'm I'm extremely optimistic about Texas. I hope that w w the trends we see will continue. That A and M will just grow in uh, in Bitcoin. We'll hopefully have at some level a university level institute on Bitcoin that covers energy, uh, f the cryptography, sound money all together. Uh, and I hope Texas can be a beacon of light in the national conversation on Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a fantastic vision. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Pierre. Um, all right. So where can folks find you uh, online? I know that you, you're prolific as a Forbes contributor. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Like that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I also have my a newsletter um, uh, yes. that I started called Principles of Bitcoin. Uh, so you can find me on Substack or go to my website, Principles of Bitcoin, uh, and subscribe. Uh, what I do in that uh, newsletter is I, I kind of tell the stories of uh, my class. Yeah. And uh, I kind of share everything I'm learning about the class. It's, it's kind of a little bit of a microcosm of Bitcoin adoption among this, these 18 to 22-year-olds. I do want to one day write a textbook on Bitcoin. And I think I'll call it Principles of Bitcoin because I, want, I, I believe the principles of Bitcoin are as important as Bitcoin itself. And most people don't understand the principles, and that's where we lose them. So we right. want to educate them on the principles. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Gabe, do you have uh, questions for Professor Karok Ray? Yeah. Um, so how do you, how do you like being in College Station? What's that What's that like? <laughs> you know, I uh, I love College Station. I told I, I I as I said, I love the students. I really love the Aggies. I wish we had more hills uh, where, <laughs> yeah. where Pierre lives. I mean, I, I would Hill I'm really nice. jealous of uh, of being able to mountain bike in your back, backyard. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. sure the uh, the whole atmosphere is a lot different from Chicago. Oh yeah, it really is. Uh, I think I think George. When I was teaching at Georgetown, uh, the grade was just the beginning of a negotiation. And at at, at A and M, you know, I uh, the the students are are still still very very humble, honest, good kids. So I I, I love and I didn't grow up with their their values. So I'm it's for selfishly, they're educating me. Actually, you know, they're <laughs> they're giving me the kind of the the Texas uh, value culture and value system that I I never had, and that what I want for my kids as well. Gotcha. And then the second part of that question is, what does the future look like for you at Texas A and M as far as more classes that you'd like to introduce? I know you mentioned you want to write a textbook. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, so what I'm tr I want to grow my two classes: the one in engineering, one in uh, in in uh, in the business school, and I want those to grow. 
Uh, I would like to probably do another class in a few years. Uh, the secret is that the professors learn by teaching classes. Actually, that's yeah. the, that's the inside joke that people don't know about. So uh, I want to do a class on uh, second layer protocols on Bitcoin, like Lightning and Fetty Mint, mm-hmm. uh, and really get into the details for computer science graduate students. I'd like to do that in a few years. Um, and I, the reality, though, is that uh, I know as a professor, it's hard to teach a new class unless you can take material off the shelf and plug it in and give students, uh, give them something to read and find a way to test them. And that's why I believe we need a textbook. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit old fashioned. I still believe textbooks matter. I learned everything in my life from textbooks. Uh, and higher education today is still based on that, even though we do have, obviously, a lot of video content like this. Yeah, well, textbooks in the sense, they're not exactly books anymore. They can be found online. They can have, you know, different types of supporting media inside of them. So if a textbook has a video in it, too, that would be pretty neat. And I think that that's where we're moving towards. You know, yeah. I know when I was at AM, and I never had a physical textbook. It was always online versions. Right. Of, you know, that's right. And 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 even um and in another example of that is is I think the mining the energy industry will need a lot of education on mining on Bitcoin because um, we have a large human capital uh, in the energy industry that's getting into the mining business. But yeah, for so uh, Gabe, absolutely right that we we want to uh, widen the aperture on the forms of delivery uh, to, to be digital and non digital too. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm biased. I I was a student of Texas A and M for a short time there, right. so I'm super glad that you're there. And I wish that at the time um, your class was offered because I definitely would have tried to you know get in that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it's super cool. I, I love to hear that Texas A and M is taking a, an approach towards Bitcoin as a leader. Yeah. And uh, I'm really appreciative of you being here today. And of course, Pierre, thank you so much for hosting. Um, you want to sign us off? Yeah, um, for those uh, who are Bitcoin miners or just into Bitcoin in general, I'd really encourage you to go look up the Texas A&M Blockchain and Energy Research Consortium and see if there's an opportunity for you to help out. Um, I think it's a fantastic group. Um, And they've got the proof of work. Like, they've already got papers up. And that's something that I, I point to people of like, hey, look, like, they are doing this research um, whether we help them or not, and, <laughs> and we ought to help them because it's really high quality research. These, these, and you mentioned the students. I mean, like, um, I love talking with the Aggies because they're so smart. Yeah, like, yeah. I, uh, I, 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 I th- that's uh, one of my favorite parts of my my role here, at Riot. Um, so uh, definitely look up um, that consortium, uh, join it if you can, uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Bitcoin Pierre. Uh, you can find Professor Kurokre at Kurokre. Yep, that's right. Uh, and yeah, thanks for joining us. And let us know if you have any questions. I'm sure that uh, we'll have Kurok back uh, yeah. at some point in the future. Uh, and uh, we'll be able to answer any questions that you send in. So thanks for tuning in and have a great week. Mm-hmm.